Okay, good evening everybody. We are now live. <laughs> Best behaviour required. Um, new one for me, having people on screen and people in person. Um, so the best thing I can do is read my script that um, has been prepared. So uh, good evening, welcome to the March meeting of the Overall Scrutiny Committee meeting. Um, Councillors and officers are reminded to put their mobile phone or electronic device on silent if they have one near them. Those present in the room should face forward, speak directly into the microphones, not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphones. Please for remote participants, mute microphones when not speaking, as this will reduce feedback and background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the council joining us remotely should leave their cameras on. Officers leave cameras on only for the agenda item you are speaking to. After each item has been presented, I will invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Those members joining remotely will then be invited to speak and they should indicate their wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Only those members of the overview and scrutiny committee uh, present in the room will be making the decisions. Uh, I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching on the webcast. Please be aware there may be a time delay of five seconds whilst a remote participant, participant appears on screen. So welcome everybody. Yep. I'm told we're not supposed to move them. Yeah. <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> right. Um, is that better? That's better. That's all right then. Good. Um, right. We have uh, everybody on, online. We're ready to go. So first item, minutes. Do I have your authorisation as chairman, the, chairman to sign the minutes of the meeting held on the 24th of January as correct record of those proceedings? Thank you very much. You. Item two, apologies and substitutions. Um, we have apologies from Councillor Drayson, um, Tony Baden, Finance Director, and Ben Hook, who has a very long <laughs> title, <laughs> uh, Director of Place and Climate and something else in planning and everything else. Um, substitutes, we have, I believe, do we have a substitute today? No, no. And those members online, we have Councillors Cook, Councillors Gray, Councillor Maynard, and Councillor Dixon. Negative. We also have Inspector Godley from Sussex Police online as well. So welcome to you. Um, additional agenda items, there are none. Disclosure of interest. Do anybody, does anybody have any disclosure of interest? I would probably think not, to be honest. No. Okay, dokie. Um, item five then, Robber Community Safety Partnership. Richard, I would assume. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the annual report of the work of the Safer Robber Partnership. Uh, Councillor Drayson is the chair of the, of the partnership. Uh, the report uh, lists in paragraph five the performance of the, the partnership over the last year and also details the work of the uh, joint action group, which is an operational group of officers which meets monthly with the police, East Sussex Fire and Rescue Service, Optivo, uh, the Mediation Service and, and Voluntary Sector. Uh, the report also gives details of the crimes reported in, in the last year, uh, which obviously um, pleasingly reports a reduction in overall crime in, in Rother. The Safe World Partnership has a, a budget to suspend on projects and paragraph 15 lists the projects which were funded last year. The council also obviously carries its own activities in relation to crime and, and reducing antisocial behaviour, uh, working with the police and other agencies such as the uh, DWP. Um, obviously our work is centred around reducing antisocial behaviour, 
uh, modern day slavery through op project discovery and safeguarding of adults and, and children. The report details are the priorities for the Safe Harbor Partnership in 2022-23. And finally, lists the training which we have identified as being needed for council staff and partners next year, uh, which includes prevent training, child sexual and criminal exploitation, modern day slavery and domestic abuse. And finally, the, the report in Appendix A gives members details of the Domestic Abuse Act 2021. Appendices B and C uh, are reports produced by uh, the police um, and Chief Inspector Godley is in attendance at the meeting remotely and um, I'd like to hand over to her to outline the reports she has provided to you. Okay, thank you Richard. Uh, Inspector Godley, the floor is yours. Uh, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, as per the report that goes through. Um, it is a positive picture, as it stands for rubber. Um, you'll see on the paperwork there that um, crime has gone down overall, as has antisocial behaviour. The, the rises that we are seeing are in public order, um, robbery, albeit only three um, offences on the previous year, and violence against the person. Um, the public order and violence against a person, um, just to give a bit of explanation and context around that, is um, well, everything dropped down during COVID and lockdown and such, and now things are beginning to rise again. Um, and also with um, the public order and violence against persons, we've also changed how we're recording our um, antisocial behaviour uh, because we weren't identifying the crimes in reports. We were just reporting them as antisocial behaviour, but that's been rectified now. Um, but overall, you'll see everything has gone down, which is a, a positive picture. The only thing I will raise is that the um, possession of weapons and possession of drugs has gone down. Actually, we like them to be quite high. Those are our proactive work that usually uncovers those crimes. Um, and during COVID, we did a lot of that. And, we, we, uh, and that's why they rose um, during that time. They've now dropped back down again. Um, so, um, so overall, it is a, a positive um, picture across all of Robber, in line with the rest of the force on the whole, but more positive for, for Robber. Um, you'll see on there also there's the, um, the distribution of crime and antisocial behaviour incidents when you look at Bexhill, Rye and Battle. As you'd expect, Bexhill show um, the majority um, of both crime and ASB incidents at 42.7% for crime and 40, uh, sorry, 52.7% for crime and 52.4% for ASB, with then Rye and then um, Battle also quite similar, um, which we would expect. Um, the hotspots for both crime and um, antisocial behaviour are Central Bexhill. Um, again, which is nothing um, that, that we wouldn't expect. Um, and the report goes through to show where those hotspots are. And then if we take out Bexhill, where it looks. Um, and again, it is the towns which are highlighted um, in that. And further down on the report, it goes down as a bit of a guide of the, um, the keywords that we can use when we're searching through for antisocial behaviour to see the proportion of um, reports, uh, what they relate to. Um, and you'll see from that that the top hits are neighbour, youth, teen, kid and child, reflecting our, our young people, antisocial behaviour, um, threat and ongoing issues. But um, they're, they're all documented in the report um, in that order. I'm quite happy to go into as much detail as you want, really. That, that, that's an overview um, of, of what the report says. But obviously, I've got lots to add as you want it. Thank you. Carol, are you, you're part of this one as well. Have you anything to add before I put it out to members? Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, one of the most important things in Rother is the partnership work that we carry out. We don't have large amounts of government funding in addition to that which we get from the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner. But what we do have is a strength in working together, which served us incredibly well compared to some other areas during COVID and continues to do so. 
Um, the crime reports that um, you've seen, um, there will be a slight variation in the figures because they've been taken at different times. So um, uh, councillors would be um, pleased to see that from the report that I did, the reduction in crime has risen to 8% um, in the figures provided by Chief Inspector Godley. Um, and in addition to that, um, we discuss on a regular basis with Inspector Carroll, who's our rather um, inspector, um, key things that probably wouldn't appear in the figures, but actually have quite a significant impact on individuals. Um, and uh, we can provide more information about that. But high risk, um, uh, intense antisocial behaviour cases, issues to do with child criminal exploitation, high risk domestic abuse cases and significant safeguarding and modern slavery issues um, are just some examples of what might not appear directly within the within the paper um, to jump out, but actually take up a significant amount of work. Thank you. Um, any members have any questions or points of issue they wish to may raise? Councillor Coleman first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think when it comes to uh, the crime in particular, sort of antisocial behaviour, um, which I know there's quite a lot of in mine and Councillor Carroll's ward, um, uh, certainly a lot of people are quite concerned about it. Um, it's, it seems to be quite a struggle to determine the difference between reported crime and actual crime. Um, I know, obviously, when f figures drop in terms of crimes being reported, sometimes that can be that not that there's less crime, but that less people are reporting crime. Uh, but then also it's quite hard, especially on social media and things like that, to differentiate between hysteria about crime and genuine issues and rises in particular types of crime. I know in Sydney, um, over the recent months, we've had quite a high uptake in people concerned about antisocial behaviour, um, concerned about groups of people, uh, particularly one or two groups of young people um, causing crime in the area. And in, in that case, it did bore out to be um, actual crime that was going on. And all credit um, to PCSO, Molly Booth, and to Inspector Carroll for, for coming to Sydney, for talking to the representatives of, uh, of Sydney and, and actually putting more resources in place to sort that out. Um, but I, I don't know if the Chief Inspector has any sort of insight onto how we as local representatives uh, can help mm -hmm. with creating that link and how, how it's possible to differentiate between crime that is reported and the crime that actually happens. Did you, did you um, get the gist of that question, uh, Chief Inspector? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, I did. Um, so there's different ways in which we do that. Um, so when we look at perception of crime and, and actual crime, um, we have a um, an engagement officer that works within our team who is also responsible for all, for all of our social media engagement. Um, and that's where we tend to get a better idea sometimes of the perception of crime compared to actual crime. Um, and what we do with that, if our researchers that look at data identify a trend hotspot, we can then compare it to the comments and the views that we're getting on social media to see if they correlate, but also vice versa. So if, some, so if our engagement officer is noticing trends on social media, we can then do some data research behind it um, to see if the two correlate and are we, have we got an actual crime issue or it is a perception of crime um, and probably now is a good idea, time to bring up the violence against women and girls because we have the Safe Space um, app, which is where anybody um, can report on there. It, it's a national program, but it's on our Sussex Police website where you can, as a female, report where you don't feel safe um, and why that is, whether it's being followed, whether it's street lighting. Um, whether it's dark alleyways, what, whatever it is, it's so you don't necessarily report crimes on there, but you report where you feel vulnerable or where you feel unsafe. And what we do, we overlay that data with our actual offences that we get reported to us. And again, it gives us an idea of the differ differentiation about what's a perception of crime and what is actual crime. It's um, I say those in a really positive way because it's good that we've got something, but we're always going to struggle because especially when we do look at violence against women and girls, 
um, the lower level offences, which people which make people not feel safe, tend not to get reported at all. And it's just a conversation with friends, which we're never going to get access to. So our big plea, as always, is if there are issues in certain areas and there is a perception, come to us and tell us, either your PTSOs or through Olivia, because then we can marry it up and we, our tactics will be different if it's a perception of crime um, than if it's an actual crime. And then, as Carol said, that's where that brilliant partnership relationship kind of working comes between us because we've got different responsibilities and we can influence different people in different areas to tackle whether it's an actual problem or a perceived problem. Again, with everything, the more we know, the better and we, the more we can do about it. So we, we have got some stuff in place, but we could always do more. So I, I, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jimmy Carroll. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my thing is that with Sidley, uh, which is uh, Sam and my area, we have two cameras that are fantastic, uh, but they um, are not used correctly. Um, I've been to the place at Lewis that does it. It's, it's very good. Um, but nobody seems to notice things, and people are asking about why aren't they using the cameras to uh, better things, giving people um, an email or something to get on to Lewis to tell people to watch something. And I think that could go a long way because when we, as a shopkeeper, you could see things happening in the area. And if you had someone that you could liaise with in Lewis, they could keep an eye on it. Then you'd have a record. Um, it's just one of these things I've, I've said over the years, and they always say it's a good idea. But I think we should look more at it and try and make your life easier and us to make our area better. Thank you. You've got, a, got an answer for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that, that would be amazing, to be honest, if we could do that. The way it works is in our control room, um, we've got our CCTV operators. Um, there's usually three working at a time that have got banks of lots of um, screens um, that monitor all of Sussex. The cameras themselves are on a time lapse and, and they record and they rotate every now and again to try and capture. And then we only actually overrule that if we're looking for something specifically. And that comes in through 999 calls, um, potentially 101 calls as well. Um, so if there's an emergency that we need to monitor, we can. And obviously we can go back and look to see where the camera was facing if something gets reported retrospectively. Um, it, it all comes down to resources. So I, I'm not even going to guess how many cameras we've got in Hastings and Rother and then the whole force that all go into that same room with three people controlling them. So we use them real time as an effective way when we get a call in or if one of our officers sees something and proactively wants them changed. Um, but it is just that I then I'm going to mention it, but I don't the control room that Hastings um, had for their CCTV, which has recently gone. That was what they did. They could control the cameras locally within Hastings um, Council. And although we got primacy on them, when we weren't using them, the, the, the camera team could, could use them and put them wherever they wanted, which was a brilliant service, but incredibly expensive to have the personnel or the personnel always on the end to be able to do that. Um, so I agree it would be amazing. Um, however, it, it's, a, it's a financial thing, really, and a personnel thing. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Jimmy? I, I think the question will go on. But uh, we've got the stuff there to do it with. And I've, I've been to the place in Lewis, and, and I, I think it's a great thing, but I don't think it's being used properly. And, and with Sidley, we pay for our own cameras. Uh, where everybody else was given their cameras. Um, but um, you've got to do it the way you see. But I, I, I just think that you could communicate with people or they could help you. It's, it's all what we're doing for the area. Thank you. I think, Jimmy, it could be something you could take up with Councillor Drayson as our as the chairman of the strategic partnership and you know, see, see how he can feed in and... and 
and work on it. But obviously the police have said there's, there's tons of cameras across Sussex and they can only look at so many at one time, I suppose. So you've got to see it from both sides. No. It's brilliant what they've got there. They've really got something. And I don't think it's being used as a full uh, province. Thank you. OK. Uh, what have we got now? Councillor Barnes. This one. Councillor John Barnes. Right. Um, Chairman, uh, a, a few comments rather than questions, if I may. Um, a very obvious one at the moment is uh, with the huge increase in fuel prices, um, there is clearly a discernible trend now uh, to siphoning off some of that fuel. I don't know whether some of our officers engaged in watching street parking can watch out for that crime and help the police. I don't know what the police can do about it, but it's clearly uh, going on in my own area, and I suspect it's true of every area. Um, I think in general this is a very satisfactory report. Um, I always think that we under-report fraud, and I, I did find it rather odd. I had my own identity borrowed. Um, in order to, for somebody who owned a lorry, to acquire insurance for that lorry in my name rather than his own. Um, no great harm to me. Uh, I reported it uh, to uh, online. I couldn't get anybody to take it seriously, uh, even though I would have thought the owner of the lorry was identifiable. And that worries me in terms of are we getting accurate reporting of some of these more ingenious frauds that are going on. Um, there are endless scams um, on my computer and on my phone. I can't actually entirely believe uh, that the incidence of fraud is as low as is identified uh, in this report. The third thing I wanted to highlight, I was a member, of course, of the partnership until uh, May 2021. There's some of the positive work that's going on, which again, I think, involves partnership with finding a job and a home uh, for those particularly young criminals who are leaving prison. Uh, because if we can prevent them re-offending um, by actually getting them into uh, employment, that clearly is going to diminish crime. And I know there's good work going on in that area, which was reported to the partnership, but we tend to focus on crime and not rehabilitation in this report. And I think a, a little more on the rehabilitation side uh, will be quite interesting. I think uh, the other thing which I would expect uh, Rauk to emphasise were they represented here and as a chairman of parish council uh, myself, uh, speeding in rural areas, in villages, continues to be a huge problem. It's entirely destructive of the social life of a village, um, where you've got a, even a moderately aged population uh, that feels it's taking life in its hands uh, to walk their children to school or even to cross the road to the local shop, uh, that is very disruptive indeed. And uh, again, I'm not sure it gets quite enough emphasis because we tend to measure uh, by accidents uh, rather than by, and I realize you can't measure near misses, um, so you have to go on accidents. But I think actually most of us who live in villages would say that speeding is a very high priority for us. And uh, again, I'd want to see that getting a little more emphasis uh, in the work of the partnership. 
Those are my comments, Chairman. Thank you very much. I do congratulate the police. So a reduction in crime is a very positive step. Yeah, I would agree with that one. Uh, right, I'm going to go online now to some councillors. Oops. Yeah, okay. David, you go first. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, Thank you're, you. Yeah, I have a list. Oh. I have a list. It's tell other <laughs> I think it's just about everybody on the committee yeah. is on that list, including <laughs> half my screen. So, <laughs> Deidre, I'm yours. I'm going to have to go back a bit now because I, I, both times I've had to speak because I wanted to talk a bit about the um, women and girls' safety and you made the distinction between perceived crime and actual crime, um, which... I'm not sure how you can really differentiate that because the women that I speak to that once upon a time would happily walk their dog in the evenings, including me, or even walk down to the town and back, no longer would do that. They're very nervous because although we might have cameras in the um, town, nobody knows exactly where they are. And even if they are, um, I'm not sure it would actually prevent anything. Um, and walking around the streets, there's absolutely nothing. And I know I'm going back a long way, but we're talking about people not relying on their cars. So we're trying to drive less. We're trying to walk more. So maybe the police could do this as well. Maybe it would be a good idea if we could now and again just have a few of the police walking around the town, walking around. We have a police station almost at the bottom of my road. And I have never, ever seen a policeman walking anywhere. I think they must do now and again. And I realise this is totally an old-fashioned point of view, but the security of knowing that there possibly is somebody walking around is a great comfort, especially to women and young girls. If they think they might walk around, or even if the people they fear think they might see somebody walking around, it's a, it's a huge comfort. It beats any camera. Thank you. I think, Deirdre, if you mention that in Rye as well about a closed police station, you probably didn't get as much. Uh, <laughs> but, but we won't go there. Um, right, I'm going to go on to online. Um, oh, oh, I'll take, I'll take Councillor Mooney. I'll take the room, the committee members first. Yeah, yeah. I'll go Councillor Mooney then. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, the officers for a fine report. Very detailed, very readable, and lots of promise in it too. Uh, so um, I have a few points. Um, and I don't know where to start, but <laughs> I think I'll start here. Um, you say um, at... Page five, you say about violent crime. Um, why do we not do some research into the causes of crime? That's one question. There's nothing here about that. I don't know whether it should be, but I think it would help very much if we had basic education in our schools and all that. Um, I know it's happening around us and it's promised, but my feeling is that once a child leaves the secondary school, it's a different person two years on. Very, very different. Why? Very noticeable. I've studied it over the years with my own children as well, of course. But uh, thankfully, they haven't got into trouble. <laughs> um, but it's very interesting. So it's just a point I'd like to make on that. So, and at number 13 and 14 on page 5, it's excellent. I've marked that good. Uh, but the bottom paragraph for number 14 is, it reads, Police and Crime Commissioner and Managed by Sussex Police across Sussex. This has not been the case across all community safety partnerships. However, the following ASB cases were reported to police during the year to the end of January 22. Now, 
Reporting is one thing, but following it up is another. I'll give you an, an example. Um, not very far from me, um, we had an incident where a person was selling a car. And um, they phoned up and said, yes, I'll come to look at it. What time are you going to be there? So she, they came and had a look, went away again, and said, well, we'll give you a ring back. So they gave a ring back, and she's, they inquired, what, uh, when could they look at the car? So they met in, she said, well, I'm not going to be there. She probably said the wrong thing. I'm not going to be there until 6 o'clock. So, oh, yes, he says, I can meet you then. When she came home at 6 o'clock, the car was gone. Now, how did that happen? We found that it happened that the guy that got into the car, he had a camera, and he actually photocopied, uh, took a picture of the numbers under the steering wheel in this particular car. He went back, he made a key, boom, collected the car. Now, my point is this. When the lady reported that to police, they said, yes, we've got it logged and we're watching the person. But she was told, and she saw the car online. She saw it even been advertised. And she was told not to do anything. What, you know, where, where do you go from here? And she hasn't heard anything since, except she got reimbursed by the insurance company, thank goodness, for a car in full. But the point I'm coming to is this. It's all very fine to report crime and look at statistics. But we have to actually visit, you know, deal with the situation, however small, because it leads to something bigger. And there's professionals out there, online and local. But we're told that local police are called to an incident. They have priorities. And so they are called. When anything happens in Hastings, all everything, they're called to uh, attend. So whatever policing is in the rural disappears. And... Frankly, the only time we see a police uh, support officer is when they come to speak at the parish council. And they make a fine speech. True. They're, they're working hard, I don't doubt. But when are we going to get back local, a local connection sort of thing with the police? That's one. Uh, so I'd like some answers to that. Uh, and... Uh, I'll, I'll try and give you all, give it all together so you can take it in each each step. Or, or do you want me to? Sort of yes, I, perhaps I should leave it there and then come back. Yeah. Do you want me to put a question to Chief Inspector now? Or on. Yeah. Um, Chief Inspector, did you did you get some of Councillor Mooney's question about so I, I suppose you know are the PCSOs going to be more visible if you like in in the countryside area? I don't know. Um, yeah, so we've changed over the last twelve months how we've operated with regards to our PCSOs in that now um, we've got a new engagement strategy. Uh, which the difference really, putting it bluntly, is that the PCSOs go out on ground level, get to know their communities and feedback. And then the strategic plan gets built on what that particular community looks like, as opposed to us sending strategic, strategic actions down, because it's recognising that every community, if you look across Robber, are completely different with the demographics and the needs and the finances, the economy, such like within them. So... What I was really pleased to hear is that you see a PCSO at Parish Council meeting, um, which is one of the drives that we've been having to make sure that we, we can't be everywhere all the time. But actually, where can we go to use our time effectively when we can hear what the concerns are of the local communities um, in order to take away work from that, understand the, um, the, the problems that people are having 
and also to feed back what we're doing. So the fact that we are at those parish council meetings is really good and probably wouldn't have happened a couple of years ago because actually we didn't get the balance right and we were withdrawing from everything. So Robert geographically is a massive area. Um, and with the number of staff that we've got working in that area, we might spend a whole, so, say if we spend a couple of hours in in a village, we get that marked out so we know where we've been and who we've been speaking to. But if we're not seen on that particular day, actually it might be another two, three weeks before we spend time in that village again. If you miss them then, suddenly you've gone for ages without seeing anybody. Um, so we're trying to target where we need to most. For example, if we do go for a walk through a village, if there's a cafe or a coffee shop or a news agent or something like that, us to poke our heads in and make ourselves known so we can say we're here to try and hit as many people as possible. So when we are there, you're seeing us um, where we are. So, um, yeah, we're, we're doing what we can to increase our vis visibility and also just to give you that more local connections. So if you go on to police.uk, you can see who your local PCSOs are and anybody can do that. And there's a way of getting, we're not going to give phone numbers out of individual PCSOs because we've proved in the past that that doesn't work, but you can come through to the, the Rother email account and request a PCSO to kind of highlight an area or if you've got something going on, which will be good engagement for us, for us to go along to, we, we can do all of that. Um, we're never going to be able to be everywhere all the time and sometimes it is luck if we are there whether you see us or not um, but we have certainly got a lot better with our strategy of understanding our communities better and I suppose my biggest plea is that we've put out to all the councils going what are the priorities in your areas and we got very very few responses so then it comes back to us telling you what your priorities are because you're not telling us um, so please, when they, when we do come and see you, tell us what your priorities are, tell us what your issues are, and then we do what you want us to get involved in, as opposed to not hearing and us kind of guessing, um, because that's what it comes down to. It's also almost subjective. Well, if I lived here, this might be my issue. We want it to come from you, so you're you're telling us. Um, does that answer that? Sorry. Yes, that's fine, but the, the damage is already done when uh, the PCSO comes to the parish council. And like human nature, when you can't uh, have everything pile up and say this, that, and the other at a parish council meeting of incidents that's happened over the last, since the last visit, or even since the last incident. Basically, what, we, what I'm really getting at is there is not a live link, communication link between, say, a, a, a parish chairman or a parish or a district councillor. We, we, I go online and I read your reports. That's right. That's true. And that, they're quite good. But does that, does that get to parish councils? Mm. It does. Councillor Mooney, can I, can I sort of stop you there and ask if you can sort of take this up with Richard and, and Councillor Drayson or, or, or Carol as well to sort of move it forward because we've, mm. we've been going for right. 40 minutes. Uh, and still well, going. that's something that, that's fine. Yes, I can do that. I just wondered if I could do that. If there was a, if there was a, a door open in that situation to, to, to deal with through the partnership. Yeah. If, if that's the case, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, there is, so, yeah, right, um, we'd better move on, this would be here all night. Um, Councillor Clark. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman, I'll be consulting to the point and brief. Uh, I want to talk about, talks about closely monitoring domestic abuse under the Abuse Act 21. Um, my concern is uh, domestic abuse reporting and the information sharing required. I can imagine victims... I know some ring up Robert and report abuse, some ring up county, many will ring Sussex Police. But how do you break down those figures? Uh, because what I'm saying is, if Robert know the amount of uh, cases that have been reported in Robert, then you can see whether last year it was lower or it was on the increase or, or is level. 
And if we're going to uh, have to do more work and research into that, we, we seem to we really need that sort of information. Um, I've dealt with domestic violence cases in my war before. I will say such as police are very, very impressive in the way that they give support to victims. I always worry about the effect of, on the children in the domestic abuse home and what support they can be given. I just didn't think there's resource impl impl implications in meeting the Abuse Act 21 Act if we're going to monitor it like this. I wonder if I have your comments. Thank you. Who do you want comments from the Chinese Sussex Police? Can, is there an answer you can give? Could I answer? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Carol. You. Yeah. Um, Councillor Clark, um, we have a, um, a joint domestic abuse group with Hastings um, because most of the agencies cover both areas. I've done a report recently on the number of cases that have been reported through and the number of cases that the support service that Change, Grow, Live um, run and the number of referrals made to the multi-agency risk assessment conference. I'm happy to share that information with you. Um, and um, if, if you would find that useful in terms of council um, implications of the act, there are some um, implications uh, for our housing department in particular, which need to be looked at. Good. Uh, right. I'm now going to go online. Councillor Cook. Thank you very much. Um, I'll make this as brief as possible. Um, I just want to start off by thanking you very much for the online street safe tool. Um, I've passed that on to my young mums and to my girl guides. Um, and I'm fairly sure that, you know, that will be something that will grow and come into into often use. Um, in battle, there's been a sudden increase in tagging and graffiti and recently a rather nasty bait of egg throwing. Now, in the grand scheme of things, when you're talking about homophobic attacks, when you're talking about attacks against women, county lines and human trafficking, this is actually very minor. But what's the best and most effective way of uh, reporting these and what kind of response would we expect to get? Thank you. So... The, the best way in reporting those, sorry, the, the best way of reporting those is um, and through the normal channels of please, please, please always go through 101 or 999 if it's emergency. With regard to what kind of response you'd expect from that, with the, so we prioritise on threat, harm and risk. Yeah. However, that kind of antisocial behaviour degenerates a whole town. If it starts looking scruffy, it's everything that comes with that. What you probably wouldn't get is a response to a particular incident if we don't know who's done it and there's no evidence to get. It will be called in through 101 and it will be recorded and it will be filed and that's it. But what we've got with our researchers and within my team is to look at patterns. And that's when we start to identify emerging risks. And that's when we tend to respond with a, a problem solving response to that. So. As I say, and, and we do it for a, a, a most of the crimes that we deal with it. We do it quite a lot with um, shopliftings or all, all sorts of stuff where actually that one incident on its own doesn't seem to be that impactive. But wh when it does become so is when that there is a pattern. And as I say, when, when a town starts to look scruffy, what does that bring? And then it attracts people to that area who then start tagging themselves. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we get that. Um, once they're reported, we will build that up. What the parish councils can do or the town councils can do is through the um, rather um, email address that comes at the bottom of all those emails. What we can't do is take reports through that because they have to go through the 101 system. But if you want to flag something and say, actually, we've had a lot of these taggings and criminal damage, they've all been reported to you online. Is there some sort of response that we can talk about? Because it might take us a while for those patterns to come through to us, um, whereas you might see it very visually and see something that's going on. So, as I say, we won't take any sort of crime reporting through that email account, but you can flag things to us, which will then prompt us to look at it and work out what sort of response. As soon as it becomes to a pattern, we we'll then assess it. Does it need a problem solving response or is it something quite straightforward that we can come and deal with? Um, in, in a different way. So feel free to flag things to us through the rather um, email account. But as I say, 
individual reports all have to be done through 101 or 999 if it's an emergency. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Maynard. Thank you very much indeed, Chairman. And first of all, I think I ought to declare an interest as Chairman of the East Sussex um, Safety Communities Partnership. And uh, in doing so, um, flag up some really interesting reports we had to that meeting last week that Councillor uh, Drayson attended um, around um, domestic violence and county lines. And, and let me give, for example, Councillor Mooney the assurance that that are what, what and, and others that, that have that have raised that issue. As, as I say, it's it's not just about um, what the police do. It's about that collegiate approach between the agencies because it's hugely important that if a midwife or a GP suspects uh, domestic violence, that that um, you know that that people who suffer uh, domestic violence, for example, um, uh, uh, that's that's flagged appropriately, and it's a multi-agency approach. And I'm, and I know that. Um, that's a little bit council speak, but I think the, the, the very idea that when somebody comes, across, comes in contact with any agency, that that, that, that that agency then report that to the police and, and encourage any victims to report to the police in the safe knowledge that they can do that confidentially during those early stages and, and the sensitivity around that. I think that's hugely important. And I think there's a role for local members to play in also um, disseminating that in, information to, the, to their parish councils. I think that the county lines work that's being undertaken by um, Sarah's team at the moment, I think, is um, something I think we'd all applaud because it is this high, you know, the high level stuff that is hugely concerning. It's hugely concerning, of course, in the urban areas, but it is spreading out there into rural areas. And, and you know, uh, again, it's that 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 issue we have as local members when we talk about the fear of crime as well as the reality. And it's somewhat unfortunate that in my own um, brother ward, actually, that we've had both a national crime in agency investigation into um, um, the making of firearms and indeed um, a, a double murder inquiry. So, so that certainly, a, 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 you know, is a problem quite clearly. But I can say, in, in reply to what what Martin said earlier, Councillor Mooney said earlier, that in terms of the 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 way that the police lies or local members, we're certainly emailed. Um, at, you know, at appropriate points in that investigation, obviously not breaching any confidentialities of every investigation that you inspect. So I'd actually say that um, I'm very satisfied with the way uh, the police are going around their business. I think that there are specific areas that we want them to concentrate on. And indeed, um, the, the police and crime commissioner is wanting, obviously, from a, from a strategic approach, um, police to, to, to concentrate on. And I think Quite frankly, domestic violence, county lines are the two, uh, and indeed um, cyber scams are, are the, the areas that we want them to concentrate on. And I just want to, to throw it back to a couple of councillors that sort of went back to the, the Bobby on the beach approach uh, that perhaps we saw in the 1970s. Well, you didn't have county lines to deal with. You didn't have cyber crime to deal with then. And, and quite frankly, um, it's that that, you know, there will be police that are beavering away working on these sort of complex investigations uh, around um, cybercrime. Um, just because you're not seeing them out there on the beat, they are working. They're working very hard, and I'm glad to see the resource that's been made available to the police to do the work that they need to do on our behalf. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gray. Oh, thank you, Chair. And thank you for a really excellent police report and all the good work you do. My apologies for not being there tonight. It's um, self-isolating due to COVID, I'm afraid. So um, I will be very speedy because I think a couple of my points have already been mentioned. Um, the first one, I just want to say that in my ward, traffic and speeding traffic is a huge problem. There's a, my residents are always asking for 20 mile per hour limits, and we don't seem to get anywhere with that. But that would be a huge help. And the other one, which Councillor Cook mentioned, is graffiti. And I know on the scale of things that does seem quite minor, but I probably get more complaints about graffiti than anything else. And really, I don't know how to reassure people. I do say that the police are aware of it, but what you can do, what any of us can do, uh, I'm at a loss, really. <laughs> so <are> you, probably. <laughs> I'll, can I just quickly say something that is... Um, Please just make sure we are aware of it. So sometimes these things happen where people say, oh, yes, it's been reported, it's been reported, and then we look on our systems, and it hasn't. I know uh, our 101 yeah. system is much better, and you can do it online. So just reassure yourself that it 
is being reported to us and yeah. we do know about it. I, I'm always telling them to report it. So thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you. Probably a bit like potholes. Don't leave it to someone else. Do it yourself. <laughs> um, Councillor Cortell. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'd like to start by uh, commending the Housing Department of Rother on dealing with cases of domestic abuse the same day as they receive them. Um, I've had a couple of cases of um, an, an individual f feeling they cannot continue to live in their home because they're being abused domestically um, by the partner and they have been rehoused in temporary accommodation the same day and I'd like to say that I think that was a, a first class service which I would like to congratulate Joe Powell and his team on. Um, getting on to my questions, um, I noticed that the Chief Inspector's report mentioned cuckooing. Now, um, I came across a case where a person uh, feared being cuckooed, um, uh, sorry, who was being cuckooed, um, feared that if they squealed, they might end up on the wrong side of the prison gate. Um, I'd like to know from uh, our Chief Inspector uh, what the police reaction to this is and whether they are safe to report it. Uh, that's my first question. Uh, yes, there is more. I've got two more. Could I, could I ask you to sort of take them with, with, with maybe with Richard later? Um, it just uh, on... Well, the, this particular one, I was... Uh, welcoming the fact that the Chief Inspector was there and might give a strategic view on how the police handle this. I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of slightly concerned on if you're talking on specific cases, that's all. Um, I was trying to find out in the general um, whether the um, uh, police would be sympathetic or give that person a hard time. I, I, I honestly wouldn't think that's an answer that the <laughs> Chief Inspector could probably give. Um, okay, I'll, well, I'll, I'll follow it up prior to the Chief Inspector then. Is, is that okay with you, Sarah, if he follows Chair, up we can answer. Or, or we can Carol? answer generically, Chair, if you'd like us to, and that is that we have, since cuckooing came into um, um, place, we have arrangements, we multi-agents arrangements that are similar to domestic abuse, Anybody who is a victim of cuckooing is given the opportunity to get additional support from other agencies. And if under duress or not complicit um, with their property being used, is given support to either relocate, remove people from the property and actually get additional support that they need. So it's not an automatic situation that somebody would even be charged with an offence. Oh, that's really and we helpful. have a multi-agency group with Hastings that meets on a monthly basis to look at all of our cuckooing cases in the round. Um, thank you. That's a very helpful answer, um, uh, Carol. I think Carol is not that's right on the head there. With you. <laughs> so if you've got any issues with cuckooing, contact Carol. <laughs> Can I touch on my other two points now? Can I ask you to take them direct to, to Carol, to be honest? Because we've we're, 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 we're nearly done an hour now. So, um, okay. yeah, if, if you could. Um, Councillor Mary Barnes. I think I'm going to have pity on you, actually, Chairman, and say, look, you know, it doesn't really matter. Except I did have a question I, I need to ask about Ticehurst. Just very, very quickly, why is Ticehurst um, involved in the secondary hotspot beat area? Um, is it anything specific? Uh, yeah, there's, oh, sorry, I can probably answer that. Um, is uh, the 
numbers are relatively small, um, but it tends to be similar areas and similar addresses um, and, and similar people that we get involved in. Um, as soon as any kind of neighbour dispute comes in, that does tend to generate quite a lot of calls. Um, and therefore, it does bring up those levels quite a lot. And, and that is something that has happened in Ticehurst. But then we do a problem solving approach to that um, of, of how we deal with that. And again, that's a massive partnership approach that we do because there's when it comes to neighbour disputes, um, actually police aren't always the best people to go forward and take that forward. So we work very closely with partners of, of what that looks like and how we deal with it. So Ticehurst is a small number that generate quite a lot of calls and therefore because the calls are relatively low generally it really flags it up and makes it makes it stand out thank you very much yeah that makes sense actually it makes sense to me anyway um right last one councillor stevens yes thank you very much um i'm speaking on behalf of right town um it would benefit if we did have police visual of a weekend particularly Friday, Saturdays, um, because there's, as you must know, Sarah, there's been a lot of increase in burglaries in the shops, um, drugs and speeding cars. And I think that it's mainly gone up a bit in Rye because they know that the police are not here and they're all in Hastings. Um, and I think it's going to get worse. So unless it's sort of tackled soon, I think we might have a problem in Rye. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased that you've brought that up, to be honest with you, Councillor <laughs> Stevens. Um, one, one thing is, I think we're just going to blow our own trumpet a little bit. Yes, there was a rise in burglaries um, in Rye, um, both residential and commercial. Um, and I think it was about three weeks ago, we charged someone with 19 offences. Um, it was one person that was hitting that quite big area around it. Um, and we got a forensic hit back from just one of those. And in the end, it was someone that we didn't know was burgling and we got we got 19 charges out of that. So that that was brilliant for us. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. With, with regards to Rye, I, I'm absolutely with you. We need to do more there. We need to have more visibility there. Yeah. Uh, my biggest concern really now we've got the burglar off the streets um, is the effect of white powder. So so cocaine supply and use in the town and the hidden crimes that go along with that. How's it getting about? tends to be linked to licensed premises. Absolutely, we need to get our visibility up there, but it's more the effective use of our resources over there generally. Um, I've got plans in the pipeline of how we're going to do that. I'm watching of interest other areas across kind of East Sussex of how they've done that and learning from that before I put all my eggs in, in one basket. Um, why is the more we dig, the more we find and the more effective we would be out there. Um, yeah. And that's that's what we're aiming to do. And that's what we're heading for. Um, I get everything that you've said. Um, does come down to resourcing um, ultimately. Um, but please bear with me because you're certainly not forgotten on my radar at all. And behind the scenes, which is what you won't see at the moment, we, we are doing some other stuff um, around Rye um, because we, we, we need to. You're right. It, there hasn't been the visibility out there and people have been able to go off and do what they want to do, thinking that they can't get caught. And at least a nightclub in Rye used to take us over there on a Friday and Saturday night. But now that that doesn't, your your visibility over the, over yeah. in the nighttime economy with the pubs needs to be better. Um, I'm trying. I have a plan. Thank you it very much. It might take a while, but I'm, I'm on your wavelength with it. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Malcolm, Chief Executive. Yeah, just a very quick point, Chairman. I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of good things to be taken out of what's, what, what the report that's been put forward tonight on behalf of the partnership. If there's one message I would say to people is, you know, please do report things. Don't assume somebody else is reporting them because the police, if you want to see resources in your area, and sorry, Sarah, for putting you on the spot a bit, but it's information the police need. And the way they get that information is through people reporting crimes. So don't just think somebody else is going to do it. Don't just ignore it. 
Um, I've, I've discussed with Sarah and her predecessors at great length over time about issues that are apparently going on, that there isn't a single crime report, but everybody will tell you it's going on. So if there's, I don't only want you to take one thing away from tonight, obviously, but if there's probably one thing that you could take away from tonight is if there is crime going on and encourage people or suspected crime, report it because that's the way that things will start to materialise. It may take time, but at least it's the start of it. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I think sort of from a countryside sort of point of view, that, you know, I know we've got our sort of threat, harm and risk and, and the county lines and the drugs and, and everything else and the speed and all, all sort of takes place, obviously, and that's why you, you, you give it the time and consideration. But... You know, a lot of people sort of in the countryside, they're more concerned with heat and oil being nicked, Land Rovers being nicked, quad bites being nicked, and, and chaps with their tools being nicked out of the side of their van. So, you know, I know it's... And I know there's a lot of work goes on with that as well. So, you know, that's how some people see it, and obviously it's, a, it's across the district, um, you know, different ways of working... Um, and it's, we're 200 square miles at the end of the day. So it is a big place to cover um, from one side to the other. Um, we've got an office of recommendation here. Um, it resolved that this committee, uh, this committee make any recommendations arising from the report to the chair of the Safe Rural Partnership for consideration. Um, secondly, this council's work uh, in relation to antisocial behaviour, crime reduction and community safety be noted, and I think that is correct in, in what members have said. Um, and they're, they're main, in the main happy with, with the position of that. And three, the possible impact of Domestic Abuse Act uh, 2021 be noted. Um, and Carol would know more about that than what I do, I know that. Um, so is there any, any points, any members... Will we be happy with that and happy for someone to move it? Happy to move, Councillor Barnes? Yep. And a seconder, Councillor Carroll? Um, I think we've probably discussed this to, to death, to be honest. Um, so um, all those in favour, just around this table. That's good. Thank you very much. Well, um, I'll say thank you very much for your time this evening, uh, Chief Inspector Godley. I think I'm called you Inspector Godley at the beginning of the meeting, so I've upgraded you, address <laughs> uh, you correctly. Um, and Carol, um, very good. Um, obviously, I think members now know that, yeah, you're on top of things as well. So, um, so that's good. And Richard as well, thank you for your time this evening. So with that, I think we'll move on. So um, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to bring the item eight, uh, draft anti-poverty strategy, forward now to, to save Claire sitting there for any longer than she needs to, to be honest. Um, so that is page 49. So let's find that. Uh, purpose of the report. Uh, Overview and Scrutiny Committee to consider and recommend to Cabinet the draft anti poverty strategy for consultation. Officer recommendation be resolved that Cabinet be requested to approve the anti draft anti poverty strategy for consultation with key stakeholders and the wider population of Robber. Do you want to kick off, Joe, or do you want Claire to? Oh, to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to get the, the, the formal introduction of the report out of the way, and I'll hand over to Claire and indeed to Councillor Coleman, if that's OK. Um, so, um, in, uh, members will be aware, in June 2021, the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group made recommendations to Cabinet that um, the anti-poverty strategy be developed. Um, and this is us coming back to you with the draft of that, concept, um, of that uh, strategy for, uh, for, for permission to go out to uh, consultation. Um, so on the 4th of November uh, 2021, we had an event at the Pelham, with, um, jointly chaired with the RVA by the Council and the RVA, where, where a range of partners were present um, from across public health, from um, the DWP Job Centre, um, and uh, from the CCG and Citizens Advice and a few other, um, HARC, other agencies, I can't get through mentioning them all, that are, that 
of, from the relevant voluntary and community sector. Um, and the actions we formed at that meeting are captured in, in, in Appendix A of the report. Um, the, the group also identified that, that, that there needed to be a delivery vehicle, like a delivery group rather, um, and a version of the group that was meeting to do the action um, plan points uh, should form itself into a um, strategy steering group, which would operate um, uh, locally to try and coordinate the aims of the strategy and the objectives of the strategy. Um, and that would report to the local strategic partnership um, that would govern the strategy steering group. Um, so the consultation is going out from the 4th of April to the 1st of May, and, and um, the consultation um, plan is Appendix B. Um, and you can see there the, 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 the who we intend to approach and the content of the consultation itself. So, so in conclusion, it's, it's clear, as we've mentioned before many times, I'm taking versions of this report to you in the past, that the, the, the causes of poverty are, are multiple, complex, and um, not really in the gift of one agency to resolve. So this is very much a position um, that, that this, this district finds itself in, in, in taking a leadership position alongside RVA in trying to draw the various agencies together in order to um, formulate a, a more effective response to the, 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 the myriad uh, causes of poverty and trying to alleviate the symptoms a little more effectively. So we're confident that the, the, the strategic um, steering group is a, is a good vehicle for that um, coordination. We, I think it's fair to say that the um, um, action plan um, ambitions are, are achievable. They, they, they are a, a, a starting point and really focused on trying to get um, systems and structures in place locally to deliver more, perhaps more ambitious outcomes in the future. That's why the strategy is also um, a short period of three years um, proposed. So we'll provide periodic progress reports to the LSP, and I hope that, that we'll be able to come to you in future with, a, as I say, a more um, comprehensive action plan um, as a legacy of, of that steering group. So. Um, We'll allow Chair to pass to, to Claire. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, so it's been it's been an interesting collaboration, I think, between um, RDC and RVA. And it started when I first came into post. So it's eighteen months ago. This work started, um, and I think it's been a really important piece of work. And it's taken a long time, but that's probably appropriate. Um, I think we've got the right organisations, the right charities at the table, and I think that meeting at the Pelham really highlighted having um, public health there, CCG, they, people want to be involved, they want to help us come up with solutions. As Joe said, it's very thorny, um, it's a complicated problem, um, and often we don't see it in Rother, it's not evident, and I think one of the Sorry to read something out, but I think um, in one of the reports that you put together, Joe, the, the um, statement by Peter Townsend um, about individuals, families and groups in the population can be said to be in poverty when they lack resources to obtain types of diet, participate in activities and have the living conditions and amenities which are customary or at least widely encouraged and approved in the society in which we belong. Um, I think... It, and as you go on to say, that actually poverty is rel relative and a child can have three meals a day, warm clothes, go to school, but still be poor because parents don't have enough money to keep a house warm. They don't have much, enough money to buy a computer for her to do her homework on or take school trips with her classmates. And this was in 2020, that 2,500 children are actually in poverty across Rother. Now that's about to escalate and... Um, sorry to quote your Facebook feed this morning, Councillor Coleman, but your comment about the fact that fuel bills are going to rise by 14 times um, what salaries are is really staggering. We need to make sure this work becomes a priority. And I think um, Joe's done a really great job of really identifying how we pull this kind of largely messy, difficult thing together. And we look at coordination, we look at accessibility and promotion but we start to really pull together the groups and charities together to kind of work on this. We can't solve it, but at least we have to have a greater awareness of what we're looking at and, and really prioritise it. Um, so I, I won't say any more about your Facebook feed post, but, um, <laughs> so, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's great that you're speaking so directly to people. 
That's all I wanted to say about it. Councillor Coleman, you as the well, the still the chairman of, of this group, so obviously you would like to speak towards it and then if you're happy, you can propose it as well. Yeah, thank you, Jaren. Thank you, Claire, for that. Um, so every day I get complimented on my Facebook feed. Uh, quite often get criticised for it, in fact, um, as is always the case when you're a public figure. Um, I, 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 I'll save my sort of speeches on poverty for the, the final stages of this when it gets to Cabinet and full council, although I'm, most members have heard me talk about poverty a, a lot, and you, you'll know the things that I say, and it's the things that pretty much anyone says when it comes to poverty. Um, we all know how bleak the situation is for someone living in poverty, whether that's absolute poverty, relative poverty, food poverty, digital poverty, health poverty, whatever kind of poverty it is, uh, for someone to not have access to things that we all take for granted. Uh, it's incredibly hard, and it's an incredibly difficult problem uh, to fix. Uh, and I really just want to give a lot of thank yous to, first of all, the, the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group and the members who sat around a, a digital table, because at the time we were under COVID restrictions, um, and listened to me chair a meeting for several hours, and we sort of put our heads together, listed as many problems as we could and as many solutions as we could, uh, and really got to grips with it, listened to uh, various organisations working on the ground with poverty and also more uh, strategically, uh, and, and gave Joe and the team some sort of direction from members as to where to go. And then obviously a massive, massive thank you to Joe, uh, to Catherine, to Joanna, to all of the other officers, and as well as Claire at RVA and all of the external partners who have worked really hard on, on trying to piece together this sort of shapeless behemoth that is poverty, because it is this sort of, it's hard to quantify, it's hard to tackle, and it's, it's hard to, to wrap a, a net around all aspects of poverty, but I, I think this is the right way to go. Um, using our uh, expertise as a sort of strategic level council and using the LSP and using external partners' knowledge to try and bring together all of the efforts that are going on. Obviously, I think the main way to solve uh, poverty or solve much of the, the problems with poverty uh, is down to central government um, and is down to a much bigger larger scale, possibly even international scale um, solution. That's, that's really what's needed to, to completely solve this problem. Uh, but in the meantime, I think it's important for all of us to do what we can uh, to try and pick away uh, at the problem. Because for every child that, that we manage to put a plate in front of, for every you know, individual that we manage to get a computer in front of so that they can have access to digital resources, to every person that we manage to get seen by a healthcare professional, you know, that really makes a difference. And so hopefully the strategy will be a start to this district council and our partners being able to do that more effectively. Thank you. And I propose and move this uh, report. Switch the machine on. Uh, Charlie, I assume you'll be happy to second this. Do you want a quick, yeah, quick yeah. statement? Okay. Um, I'd like to congratulate on this report because... Um, it is a very difficult area to resolve. Many of the issues around poverty are outside robbers' control, like uh, benefit levels, but we've already made some progress. If you look at housing, we have the tendency to find a scheme, which means we're trying to get families into uh, properties where the rent is affordable and, and it doesn't drive them in debt because the rent's so high they can't afford it out of the wages. We, we're pushing the agenda for uh, social housing for the Alliance Housing Company. Uh, the council also supports with the council tax reduction scheme and also the hardship fund, which I know people have, uh, have uh, accessed. But I think it's a bigger picture because I'm sure in Sydney, as well as Pedram, a lot of young families are only surviving because their parents are helping them out with bills. They're buying school uniforms. They're paying some of the bills when they go to Tesco. And with a huge increase of, of um, fuel prices, I know many young families are absolutely terrified of what the next bill is going to be, and there's no doubt a lot of these bills will never be paid because they will never be able to find the money. So, you know, the energy companies are going to have to come up with different solutions to what's happening at the moment. Um, when you look at, like, Sydney, and, and Sydney, we're on East Sussex figures, 45% of the residents in Sydney are on some form of benefit. So they're on very low income wages. They're living on, they're surviving on their bed.
Yeah, I congratulate you on your report. I think it's tremendous. I'm really pleased that Rob is trying to address this very difficult issue. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Well, um, I, to be honest, do you, is, it, is, it a, is it a point worth making, Councillor Mooney? Because what I'd like to do, I'd like to say yes, that... Yes. Just one know, question. The, the group one question. Has, the group has worked, worked on it, so I don't think that we as a committee almost need to sort of... I want to ask one question. Go on. Please. When will we get the first report? And... Will we continue to get regular reports? Thank you. I think that was two questions, but I would say yes yeah, yeah, and yeah. yes. <laughs> would that be fair, Joe? <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, well, the intention is to take reports to the local strategic partnership, um, which um, will then we can take a, a version of that to, to the overview and scrutiny committee if there's time in, on the work plan for that. But um, that will be for you. Your good self to, to decide. <laughs> and, and I would assume there will be somewhere we'll have a, a, a benchmark facility like we're going to look at later on. The, the uh, uh, forget what they're called now. What do they call them? Um, uh, performance reports. So, you know, obviously if something is, is getting better, then we're, you're going to tell us. And obviously, if something's getting worse, you will also tell us. So, so there'd be a be benchmarking on it, I suppose, from somewhere. I think we can undertake to, to bring updates on the actions. I mean, this doesn't um, represent any investment to the to the council, so there, there wouldn't be necessarily a return on investment. We need to evidence, and we don't control. We're not pretending to control the causes of poverty. We're not pretending as an objective to reduce poverty with this no. endeavour. Which we're, we're trying to better manage its effects yeah, sure. locally. So. I think the only way of really providing you updates would be through more of a qualitative um, impact sort of summary, really, and, and which would be, you know, largely based on impact, but on, on anecdote. But we can also provide up-to-date statistics from the indices okay. of multiple deprivation in terms of tracking yeah. Yeah. poverty progress. Absolutely, we can yeah. undertake to, what, to, to do that. What, what the council was talking about earlier on. Uh, have, have you done then, Councillor Mooney? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. If, if I may just add quickly, Chair, sorry. Um, just that if any of my fellow viewers and scrutineers do have thoughts and comments on extra things that can be done in this area, um, there are other means as well. Um, I'm quite keen to sort of keep the anti-poverty task and finish group uh, bubbling in the background a bit to keep an eye both on this project and also any other things we can do, specifically as a council that we can do, uh, and separate reports can always be brought through the council's um, procedures in that regard. And also, I am obviously the cabinet spokesperson for uh, young people and child poverty, so particularly in that area, I'm more than happy to consider uh, ideas from, from other members to, to bring forward directly to cabinet um, outside of this strategy. Thank you. Councillor Barnes, is it succinct? Yes. I, uh, Having sat on the group, I'm not going to uh, take long, but I just want to make uh, three quick points. Um, I think probably the most urgent task for our housing department now, and I don't know how we accomplish this, is insulation, uh, because fuel poverty is clearly going to be uh, the major problem of this year. Um, and is likely to go on for some time. Um, it was already a problem, but it's going to be more. Um, I was very struck in the course of our discussions uh, that I sit on the Health and Wellbeing Board. I know from my previous experiences, uh, a chairman of a PCT, of the work of the LSP, but I wasn't clear how this council becomes aware of what is going on on those bodies, um, which are relevant to this strategy. Um, now I think that's a point for overview and scrutiny to consider uh, when they come to their work program. My last point was on consultation. There are one or two obvious uh, charities not on the list uh, that are dealing with poverty which I think we need to identify and include. And I noticed the absence of the churches. 
who have played a very considerable part in uh, coping with some of the consequences of COVID, I think it would be worth adding them to the consultation list. Okay. Claire, did, did, did you have an answer for... Just, um, just to say that um, HUG are um, part of the church group, um, which church it is? Church Churches yeah. Together, um, so they were represented in, in the um, committee group that we held, and they will be in this working group going forward. I'm sure members can give you one or two of the charities that we know that are operating, which can be added to the consultation list. That would be helpful. Thank you. Good. Um, Councillor Cook. I've just answered my own question by reading a little bit further down. It was about um, all the consultation being online, but I see there are going to be paper copies available. Thank you. <laughs> At least you're honest. <laughs> Um, right, well, if that's it, um, I'd better say thank you from, from, from the, the most of us to, to Councillor Coleman and, and members of the group who have put this together. Um, obviously, Councillor Coleman in his position as spokesman will keep an eye on it as well. So, so that's good. Um, and we're moving on to, um, to, to Cabinet. So it's been moved by Councillor Coleman, seconded. Did I say seconded? No. Councillor Clark. All those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Claire. Um, performance progress report, third quarter, pages 22 to 40. That's Lorna. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Well, this report is actually Ben's, but um, I'm going to present it. I'll keep it short and sweet because I'm assuming you've, you've read the report but this is our usual quarterly monitoring report of the 13 key performance indicators around the five themes um, that um, you've highlighted to concentrate on. Um, I think they're all for the third quarter apart from the waste collection which was the second quarter which has a bit of a lag um, and in the appendix we have an explanation of the performance. Um, I don't think the reds on, um, in, in the report really reflect the performance in terms of improvement. There are a number of areas that are improving, su such as planning. Um, but the green ones also um, are ones that I think uh, we'll want to keep an eye on, particularly around uh, the number of council tax reduction um, claimants and council tax collection rates. So these are things that, all, although green at the moment, for all the reasons we just discussed in, in the last report, I think we need to monitor very closely. Um, so, really, just to take any comments and any recommendations that you wish to, to take to Cabinet, we still have Joe here as Head of Service who can um, answer any questions you have around housing, and Malcolm and I will do the, our best with uh, the rest of the report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, our, our job here is... Um, Consider these findings and recommend any actions to Cabinet as necessary. So unless anybody's got any questions or actions they feel we need to move in this, it's... Yeah. Councillor Barnes? <laughs> I find myself in two <laughs> ways. When I look at the additional income, uh, the net income for all the investment assets, Actually, I was slightly surprised to find this is a red given what's in the report. Although, actually, I think it's red uh, because I think um, uh, we would have been further ahead but for COVID in generating more income here than the target for the year. But we are, as far as I can see, spot on the target for the year, which made me slightly wonder why it was a red. Um, obviously, one is concerned, I think, uh, still at the number of reds around housing communities. I'm not apportioning any blame. It's just a situation where it's a continual struggle. Um, I wanted just to raise a question, which is, for obvious reasons, uh, we're getting rid of the 
average figure of length of time in temporary accommodation, uh, because that can give you a very misleading picture depending on who's on the list. On the other hand, since the average is above where we really want to be, I'm just wondering if there's any other way of measuring progress in that area. And I just wondered if the range ought to be reported rather than the average, because that will give us an idea of what the worst cases are and what the best cases are. Um, in other words, we would still be looking at it with a view to being able to ask a question, but without a misleading indicator. Hmm. Who wants to try and fill that one then? <laughs> Joe, Joe looks like he can do that. I would like to say I can try. Um, I, I, I think that's how there's some merits to that, and, and it would be a helpful indicator, I think, as opposed to a measure, um, and something we can certainly look to, to provide. Um, it, I think the max, the minimum will be a day, because we, we have people placed every day, but the, the maximum will, will be, um, yeah, variable. But I, I would come back to the point I make, I've made quite a few times in this context, is around the need to transform TA away from thinking of it as temporary accommodation to supportive accommodation that's actually of benefit to people. And that's part of our temporary accommodation support scheme that we, we have, you, the Cabinet and Councillor are investing in, which is a £10 million programme of, uh, of investment with supported accommodation. So that's accommodation with, um, at the moment, we have an RP partner delivering the support, but there's plans to commission something more more, more uh, fuller in, in the next month. So in that measure, it, 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 the, the, the average length of stay becomes less of a... Less of, a, less of a desired objective. The objective might be to actually keep people in that accommodation so that they engage with the support and don't, uh, don't uh, you know, go back to rough sleeping, for example, or, or, or disengage and go back into a, a domestically abusive relationship, for example. So it's really about what, what are the council's priorities and, and I suppose the form of accommodation, if, if it were to shift, perhaps the function of, of what we want to measure would, would shift as well. So I hope that's, that's a bit of a long-winded answer, by the way. Um, I'd, I'd just like to respond to your point around um, how useful the greens and the reds are in terms of understanding our performance. And I think this is something that perhaps we, we can have a look at when we have the new set um, that come in in the next financial year, because we're not actually using that amber kind of warning um, status. So perhaps we need to look at the threshold um, of what's acceptable. And actually, some of these reds might actually be an amber, and that might be something that we want to consider going forward. So it's a, it's a good point. I had one other point, Chairman, um, which was a, a bit of disappointment. I'd like to understand a bit more, probably outside this meeting rather than in, um, why our progress on planning uh, seems to have drifted recently. We were making very substantial progress, um, and it now seems to have stalled slightly or even got slightly worse. And I'd like to understand why, because we are flinging quite a lot of resource at that, and uh, we have a very competent planning manager. Um, so it puzzled me that that the progress there seems to have slowed, and probably best explored outside this meeting. But I thought I'd flag it up. Um, Chief Executive might have a bit of an answer. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, just, just to reassure Councillor Barnes, I mean that that position has been recognised, and there is work going on at the minute to to address that situation. So very happy to talk about you know that that in detail. But just to reassure members that you know this council did invest a lot of money to deal with the situation. Part of what we wanted to do in dealing with that was to make sure that we recognised when performance was dipping again so that we didn't get into the situation we were in. So that's what we're doing at the minute. There is still some more work before we can give any more detail, but just to reassure Council Barnes that that is being undertaken. And thank, thank you for the point. Yeah, and I suppose that sort of ultimately the, the, the figures are reported to the Planning Committee monthly, aren't they? So, Whilst 
the planning, you know, we could argue the planning committee haven't sort of kept their eye on the ball, if you like, over the last few years when it got worse, or worse, and then obviously they are now. Um, um, we're looking at it as well if need be. So, so I just... just to clarify, and I think I think Councillor Barnes did did uh, summarise it quite well. We are still improving, but the rate of improvement has slowed down, yes. and that's the bit we need to identify. It's not that it's actually getting worse, but it's not getting. You know, we need to make sure that that rate of improvement continues. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Good. Um, so, are we happy with it? As it is, so we're happy to recommend this to Cabinet. Um, someone want to move that? Councillor Barnes, seconder. Councillor Maidley, thank you. Um, all those in favour? That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, where are we at now? Seven. Revenue budget and capital program monitoring quarter three. Uh, with Tony's, Tony's not here, so Malcolm's going to take this one. Thank you, Chairman. I, I was just going to give um, members a brief overview of this. Um, I mean, the report is, is asking members to note the quarter three forecast, and you will note in paragraphs 22 and 23 there's reference to two um, service level agreements for Rother Citizens Advice and Bexhill Museum. Just to give you the headline, the revenue budget is, I'm going to use the expression underspent. It's not actually underspent. There's an improvement um, of 222,000 on what was the quarter two position, which actually means we will draw down 128,000 in reserves than originally planned. The capital forecast capital outturn is 15.3 million, which is well below budget. And I think something worthy of note is that council tax and um, national non-domestic rate collections have both improved on last year, so we're in a better position. So Appendix A takes you through the details and the main changes are explained in paragraphs 4 to 15. Um, the largest areas in terms of the, the, the improvement by 222,000 has been the strategy and planning overspend has decreased by 54,000 that you'll see which is due to a reduction in the cost of using capita business services. Some of that may we may need to come back to with the previous comment that Councillor Barnes raised. We've received further grant funding of 270000 to help with the cost of managing COVID grants, the, the last one being the Omicron grant. One of the comments we're making collectively to central government is actually giving us constant I was going to say small pots of money, 270,000 isn't a small pot of money, but constant pots of money for different issues isn't actually helping us at times in terms of planning and certainly in terms of our financial forecasting. Um, there has been an increase in staffing, resor uh, staffing costs in resources. It's mainly due to the fact that we've had to use temporary resources um, in finance for year end and budget preparation. In the capital program, which is Appendix B, forecast of 15.3 million is 47.3 million lower than the approved program, and that's mainly been down to the pandemic slowing the, the, the pace of the program. Um, the main change in the program relates to the purchase of Mountview Street. Um, the NHS have a purchase option on part of the site, and the receipt from the sale will offset purchase costs. There will be no overall impact on, on our program. And, or on borrowing, but I think it's worthy of note that that was a really good example of us facilitating something happening and actually making it happen. Um, other schemes showing an underspend in 2021 are still expected to complete. So the, the long and the short, which in, in Appendix C refers, it brings us down to a drawdown from reserves, which is actually 201,000 lower than planned, which is relatively good news in, in terms of what well, is good news. Collection fund performance, as I've said, in both cases, in both council tax and NNDR, is slightly higher than they were at the same time last year. I think given some of the discussions we've had on, on, on the anti-poverty work, that's something we obviously need to keep an eye on. Um, but the NNDR collection rate has recovered extremely well from quarter two, 
and um, when the figure then was 6.36% lower. So that's been a quite a marked recovery, which I think probably says something about the sustainability of our businesses coming through COVID. And actually, one would like to thank some of the support that's come through us by the central government. In paragraphs 22 and 23, it refers to two um, uh, service level agreements. Both these were agreed two years ago with, with four-year funding, but members asked for a review after year um, two. We are suggesting that in both these cases that we... Um, we, ex we give them a further one year's funding and carry out the review this year. In terms of citizens' advice, there are some proposed changes in the way that is being set up. And I think this is an opportunity, again, coming back to the work of the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group, about looking at making sure that we direct our resources into those areas that are, are, are most needed by our community. And the other one is Bexhill Museum, which you're probably aware we are having ongoing discussions with the town council. And rather than make a decision now, it was felt that it would be better to leave that and review it again next year and, and, um, and see what happens. Um, I would like to say I'll happily take any questions. When I say I will happily take any questions, that really means that, um, that I will happily take them, but I will pass them on to Tony Baden to, to answer when he's back. Um, I don't know, Councillor Dixon is, is with us this evening remotely, and I don't know whether Councillor Dixon has anything he would like to add. Yeah, I was just going to get to that. So, Councillor Dixon, if you're there, then uh, now's your chance, and thanks for putting up with us so far this evening. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you, Malcolm. You, you, you sounded very professional there, as if you knew what you were talking about. Um, the only thing I'd like to point out really is the uh, Bexhill Museum funding is currently um, is currently um, raised through Bexhill special expenses. So this is just a one year gap while the um, the uh, negotiations with uh, Bexhill Town Council take place. It really uh, doesn't affect very much of, of our funding. As I said, it comes from um, special expenses and the uh, the CAB, which I, I know Councillor Gray will be declaring an interest in shortly, um, will be. Um, we, we, when we had this in the original um, four-year period, we wanted to bring this one back after two years because we were aware of issues that were the CAB had and how they were raising their money. Um, and I think we've uh, we, we've improved right to get that back after two years because the CAB has got issues at the moment with its service. Uh, and I think this is a sensible move just to do one year to uh, to help them out and then review again. But apart from that, uh, Malcolm summarised the situation very well. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Polly, you've you've got a, a hand up there. I'm assuming that's a new one. Is you anything, um, anything you want to say? Yes, it is. It is a new hand. Um, yes, I'm sorry. I should have declared at the beginning that I am the Rother District Councillor um, connected to the um, CAB. And I am aware that they have had a lot of difficulties. And I agree with what Councillor Dixon said, that it's right that we should um, allocate the grant for this year, but then review it again. But they do do excellent work, and they do save the council a lot of work. So I do support them wholeheartedly. Okay, thank you. Um, who have I got? I'll, I'll, I'll go Councillor Coleman first, and then Councillor Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Um, in, in terms of the CAB, obviously, in terms of the poverty front, they are absolutely an essential service. I think it's the main place that councillors and other people refer people to when there's a an issue that needs sort of multi-agency support at the moment. Um, <laughs> In my experience, the CAB sometimes are very effective. Sometimes people are finding them less effective. And in particular, there seems to be issues between communication between RDC and the CAB and vice versa. Um, when, well, I think when councillors are getting emailed by uh, citizens' advice officers with cases saying, can you help get this seen by the appropriate officer at the council, clearly there's not enough of a connection between the CAB officers and the the council that they're needing members supporting that. Um, I, I, I don't know how that's how that's looked at. Um, I, I don't know if Councillor Gray might even have some sort of comments on on from her perspective, being in both camps, if you like, what the CAB could maybe do more for RDC and what RDC could do more for the CAB. Because I think a lot of the problems are mainly communication and are mainly things that aren't budget based and aren't money based. Um, 
obviously there are also financial issues. Um, but I don't know if Polly had any views on that. I think the chief executive um, might have you. Do, do you want me to answer now? Uh, um, well, you go ahead, Polly, and then I'll go to Melbourne. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's not a lot I can add. Uh, the CAB have had huge problems, um, not least with their accommodation and staffing. So they, I think they are well aware that they are not... Um, you know, acting to their full potential at the moment. But in the past, they have done excellent work, and I'm sure that they do want to get back to full capacity again. Um, so that's about as much I can say at the moment. But, you know, they are working very hard on this, and they do offer such an essential service. So I think they do very much deserve our support. OK, thank you. Uh, Malcolm. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Just, just to clarify, I agree entirely what, with what Councillor Gray has said. I mean, this, is, this should not be seen in any way as any question mark over this, this Council's support for citizens' advice. I mean, we see them as an integral part of our service. I think it's about having discussions in the light of our you know, emerging anti-poverty strategy and soon to be developing anti-poverty strategy about making sure that our resources are being, are being directed in the right, in the right way. Um, I think we, 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 you know, part of what we need to have is quite a wide-ranging discussion with, with citizens' advice and then with us. I mean, it's a two-way discussion about how we just ensure that happens, how we're assisting them you know, financially and what we're getting in, in return for that. So I, I'm very positive you know, with the limited involvement I've had in the discussions, but you know, I've been involved with Councillor Gray in some early discussions, and I know there are still some ongoing ones. I think they're very positive, and there's a willingness on both sides to move forward. We know there's a situation, and particularly with post-pandemic, you know, with different ways of working, of just making sure we're reflecting that in terms of what we're putting in and what we're getting out from it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Barnes. First, to plea about language, Chairman. Um, <laughs> I got increasingly irritated, I think is probably the right word, uh, the use of surplus and deficit all the way through. Uh, the, it's not an appropriate language. Uh, the position has either improved on budget or it's worse than budget. Uh, but in no case are we talking about anything that I would recognize as a surplus uh, or as a deficit. And I think it gets in the way of understanding because you tend to get cross about the language and not appreciate the points. Uh, so if we could find a better way of phrasing, I would be grateful. We are very late in the financial year considering the third quarter. Uh, there's only another fortnight to go. So I don't think we can make many useful recommendations tonight um, on that. I will content myself, therefore, with two observations. I think the one which really worries me is uh, the fact that the position on the financial stability program is so much worse than budget. We had a very clear warning from Tony Baden in his report of the importance of actually making savings. And um, I think we really must uh, reinforce the drive for savings in the coming year, because we're still in genuine deficit to the tune of three million quid uh, on our running costs and our income diverged by three million. And that has to come out of reserves. If we don't drive a savings program forward, whoever is in control in the next council will have a very, very difficult problem. My last point actually is a rather trivial one, but I think a very important one, and it's on paragraph 23. Because this is talked about as the Bexhill Museum, uh, we're talking about handing it over to the Town Council. I'm not altogether sure, and I would want to urge some genuine thought about whether that is appropriate. I know it's not the only museum in the area, but it does contain some very important uh, remains 
from particularly the Bronze Age fields uh, to the east of Beggs Hill. It's a museum of some considerable importance to Rother, and whether we should really consign it to a town council which may or may not have the finances to sustain it, I think deserves some serious consideration by this council. I don't think we should lightly regard it as one of the services of, that is only of interest to Bex Hill and should necessarily go to the town council. Uh, so I'm happy to support the suggestion that we extend the funding only for a year while we review it, but I hope we review it quite seriously to see whether it's of rather wide importance, as I believe it to be, uh, rather than simply of Bex Hill importance. I would support, incidentally, again, uh, reviewing our relationship with civil, uh, with um, citizens' advice. But I do value that service, and I think we do need to be very careful in our minuting that we are not suggesting in any way terminating our connection with citizens' advice. Okay, thank you. Um, I think Malcolm might have an answer or, or comment anyway. Um, just on the financial stability programme, just to, to, to sort of highlight to members rather than answer it tonight, there is a report on the agenda for the next Cabinet meeting, which will start to, to uh, put meat on the bones and, and resources on the bones to deliver that programme, much for the reason that, that Councillor Barnes has said, which I think has been recognised and certainly Councillor Dixon, I know, speaking for him, but when he was... I was going to say sitting in front of me. I can see him in front of me, so to speak. Um, and, and the second point is, I mean, I would say that the museum is under discussion. And, I mean, I think we need to be very careful not to prejudge any discussions. I mean, we are having you know, very open discussions with the town council, and, and um, those discussions are very positive on both sides. But they are discussions at this point in time. And, and I think members should just need to be aware of that, that it is not decision point. But I would stress that there will come a point at some point, probably later this year, as in calendar year, when we will need to start making some decisions about some of these and how we're going to deal with it. Because as Councillor Barnes rightly says, um, we, have, um, you know, we have still got a hole to fill and that hole needs to be filled. Um, I can't say very much else tonight other than I'm hoping for some good news on the additional income front in the near future and that will be reported as soon as, as soon as we can but I think it is looking positive it is looking better than it was but I still think we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the challenge that we're faced with to deal with it thank you chairman thank you I think it's probably worth noting that we've um I think Joe mentioned that we was completing on more purchases as well, wasn't we, for, for temporary accommodation, which, while spending money, gives us significant savings over third-party accommodation and and better accommodation for, for us as well, so or, or for residents who need it. And um, Camp, did you say Councillor Dixon? Did you? Yeah, Councillor Dixon, did you want to say anything? Come back again? Were you happy? Um, I, only about the Bexhill Museum, um, I, as I remember it from the days of when I did the, um, these grants, the £8,500 that's um, on this is only a, a fraction of what actually we do give to the museum altogether. I believe we give them either subsidised or free rent, plus there's the use of the um, custodian as well across all of the museums. This is just a top up as a recognition of what they do from uh, the people of Bexhill through their, their um, special expenses. So a transfer over to the town council really is neither here nor there. It just means that we can actually raise more uh, council tax ourselves without having special expenses. So I don't think we should need to get too hung up over just the £8,500. That isn't all that we give the, the, um, the museum by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you. Um, Councillor Moon, I see you indicated. I'm sure as an accountant you have signed a sign. <laughs> Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, one of the points I was going to bring up has already been dealt with because it can't be discussed as the CEO has uh, expressed very clearly. Uh, but the other one is going back to the Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, I had a case uh, referred to me by the Citizens Advice Bureau 
and I was very pleased to deal with it. And I think they did exactly, precisely what they should have done. So I'm, I'm, I'm very praiseworthy of them, so far anyway. Thank you. So can I assume you'll be happy to move the recommendation? Good. Uh, Councillor uh, Mrs Williams. Uh, just briefly, just wanted to support Councillor Barnes when his uh, point about the museum, because although it is in Bexhill, it's a very significant museum, and it's valuable too, rather. And I would be really worried about the Town Council of taking it on. I think it's too big for the Town Council. And I, 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 I realise we're in discussion about it, so I'm happy to wait for the discussions on it. But um, I do think we should flag it up, how important Bexhill. It, 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 perhaps it shouldn't even be called Bexhill Museum, because it isn't just about Bexhill. It is largely, but there are some significant things in there. So much that a lot of it isn't even on show. They just can't get it all on show. They, they move it around. And uh, there's a lot of it that if we had it, if it was bigger, you could you could have a lot more. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Executive. Want to come back? Yeah, can I just sort of stress again what we're talking about in this is is an SLA for eight thousand um, five hundred pounds that comes out of Bexhill special expenses. We are not talking about transferring Bexhill Museum at this point in time. Um, yeah, I have no doubt in our discussions with the town council it may well be raised, and those I mean because we're we're not closing any door. But this this agreement tonight and the SLA tonight is just for this funding of eight thousand five hundred. It is not for, off the top of my head, about another forty odd thousand pounds. I think that we we give in other ways. So just to reassure members. Yep. So well, you can see the officer recommendation in resolve that the report be noted. And Cabinet be requested to approve the continuation of two service level agreements, one to Citizens Advice Bureau for a 12-month and the same to Bexley uh, Museum for a 12-month. Um, Citizens Advice, 85,000, and the Bexley Museum, 8,500. It's been moved by Councillor Looney, I think, and seconded by... Well, I thought I'd call Councillor Williams, but we, we go for Councillor Coleman as a seconder. So, all those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, final item on the agenda, work programme. So, next meeting is the 25th of April, approximately six weeks. It probably is six weeks. Um, there we have the final report and recommendations of the Constitution Review Steering Group, um, called in emergency procedures, draft annual report to Council and progress on the environment strategy. So there's a fair bit to be going on with there. And then you'll see the work program for 2022-23 and items for consideration. So what I would say at the moment is we're just, if we're happy to take the 25th of April meeting and then we see who's where. <laughs> Starting a new financial year. And, and go from there. There may be some changes on the committee, who knows? Um, and then we can work that to, to what the committee then wants. Councillor Barnes. I think it'd be logical to add to the items for consideration uh, the two uh, bodies that I mentioned earlier, uh, the LSP and the Health and Wellbeing Board. Because at the moment, I sit there um, I did ask at the last meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board whether they made an annual report. They don't. Um, so either I am going to have to find somewhere to summarise what we've done in the year, um, but I've nowhere then to send it other than the member's bulletin. And it seems to me that since this is the principal public health body in the county, and we have an LSP, uh, which we never hear about until it came up at uh, the group that Sam chaired. Uh, again, somewhere we need just to recognise that very valuable work in terms of e equality of outcome is being done by that body, and it is... We are a key partner because we are the housing authority, um, and yet 
we don't hear about it. So could I add this to the work programme for consideration, whether this is the right body or some other body uh, to hear about them? Okay, you got that, Louise. It was, yep, you got it. Good. Are we happy with that? Yep, oh, Councillor Cortell. Um, I would also like to suggest that we add the infrastructure company that we had a um, special um, full council meeting about. Um, it is, uh, it's got loans at the moment of, um, in the region of £7 million pounds, which have to be repaid in the next five years. Um, it um, uh, has run on a um, uh, loss for the past two years. Um, we decided unanimously as a council um, not to appoint a um, representative on the board, but we remain a member of that company. There was a strong indication that we would ask the overview and scrutiny committee to take a look at it. And I'd like to suggest that we um, invite um, the chair or the chief executive of that company to the next meeting of the overview and scrutiny committee. Okay, I understand. I'm sure Kevin Councillor Dixon has just put his hand up. So um, he, he may be well better served than what I am to answer your question. Um, well, I was going to report, Chairman, that uh, we'd already had a discussion about this and felt that full council might be the better place for um, for them to report to, so everyone can have um, ha have, a, have a have their say, if you like, because it's not just uh, the scrutiny committee that would like to have a, a few words. I think cabinet would as well. That's fine. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's fair to say. Um, Kevin and I did have a discussion last Monday, briefly after the meeting. And we decided that if, if the sea space or sea change or whoever they wish to be called sea change um, were going to come to any meeting, it would probably be best to come to a full council where there would be a full, uh, well, more of us, if you like. <laughs> and we, we, we know that they, they haven't attended um, similar requests to go to Hastings Scrutiny Committee, so why would they come to ours, to be honest? Councillor Barnes? Yes, I, I think I probably agree with Councillor Dixon. I certainly am not sure we're the right body. Uh, there may be a case for audit uh, taking a preliminary look before it goes to Council. But I don't think overview and scrutiny is the right body to look at that company. Good. I think we are in agreement with that. <laughs> Looking around the table, I think everybody's nodding in the right way. Um, Happy with what we've got? Yeah. Um, well, that's good. So what I would do is say that's the meeting closed today at 8.28, I think. Thank you very much for your attendance. Have a safe journey home, unless, of course, you're already there. <laughs>